Glory, 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 glory to God. Father, we thank you for the blessing. We thank you, Father, that it does rest mightily upon our household, upon our family, both far and near. We thank you, Father, that you commanded a blessing upon us today and you cannot reverse it. Thank you for being a covenant making and covenant keeping God. Thank you that your word is tried and true. Thank you, Father God, that you are indeed our source, our strength, our redeemer. You are indeed our strong tower, Lord, and we bless and adore you today. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us, for keeping us. Ho, 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 ho. Hallelujah. Yes, you are so faithful. You are so faithful. Let's just go ahead and right at wherever you are, if you're able to, just go ahead and lift your hands up and thank God that he's faithful. Father, you're faithful and we thank you for it this morning. Oh, be magnified. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Lord God. You are indeed Jehovah. bless your name. Amen, 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 amen. Glory, 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 glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, amen. Well, praise God. Welcome, 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 welcome to Impact Church Nova. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. And Impact Online, we just thank you for joining us and tuning in with us on uh, this morning, we're delighted to have you with us as well. Praise God. Amen. Just give me a little thumbs up from the back if you would. Amen. Praise God. Trust all is indeed well. Amen. Praise God. So my name, of course, is Robert Brooks and my wife, Mignana, and I pastor Impact Church Nova located right here in Great Ashburn, Virginia. So we just are delighted to be with you today. Delighted to have you join us uh, on this morning. Praise God. And um, excited about the word of the Lord uh, that God has for us on this morning. So we want to take this opportunity to say hello to uh, all of our uh, Impact Church Nova family who are here joining us on today. And for those who are joining us online and uh, those who may be joining us for the very first time, we thank you for tuning in as well. We're delighted to have you uh, with us on today. So we just say thank you for joining us. Uh, thank our family members and you know, Michigan and Arizona and family and friends are tuning in in Florida and other places. And uh, we're just honored to once again to have you with us, um, you know, again. So we're delighted. Uh, we're stepping into part three of something that we uh, started over the last couple of weeks. And I uh, believe I'll close it out today. I believe I uh, just get through what God has uh, for this morning and uh, we'll just continue to pray it through. But uh, trust has been a blessing to you. I want to encourage you, as always, if you get a, given an opportunity, you can go back and listen to uh, the first uh, two parts of this particular week. So last week we talked about, um, uh, amen, but well, before we do that, we definitely want to pray. So let's just go ahead and uh, set ourselves, and uh, we've already prayed this morning, but we want to pray again and just bless this opportunity. So go ahead and bow your heads with me, uh, if you would, right there where you are. Heavenly Father, we say thank you once again for your word. Uh, we know that it is indeed a lamp into our feet and a light into our pathway. We thank you, Father, for the power that it has to produce change. And we just give you praise, glory, and honor for revelation knowledge of it on this morning. We declare that your word will have free course, Father God, and it will do exactly what you intended for it to do in the lives of your people on today. I ask, Father, that you increase in me as I decrease in the flesh. And I pray, Daddy, that it's all of you and none of me that any man or woman should see here on today. Only that I will speak your word with power and authority. So we thank you for that. We give you praise, glory, and honor for every great thing that happened in our midst. And Holy Spirit, uh, we give you free reign to do what you desire to do. Say what you desire to be said in this moment. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. Well, you all ready for the word of God this morning? Amen, amen. Well, let's just dive right on in there. I'm going to have you turn over with me, if you would, over to James chapter 1. That's kind of been our text over these last two weeks. Uh, and as I was mentioning just a moment ago, last week uh, we talked about, you know, really how to persevere. Uh, we talked about perseverance and, you know, really the, by definition that it gives us in the Greek, you know, to have some perseverance or really to be patient, that patient as it says, says in 
uh, many of those translations that we read and talked about on last week. It really means to have some cheerful or hopeful endurance or some constancy to whatever it is that you're doing or whatever God has you doing. But we talked about on last week how we want to have that same cheerful endurance, that same hopeful endurance, that constancy and steadfastness, you know, even in the midst of stressful times. And we want to be able to maintain that from the very start of start of a thing, excuse me, all the way through the end or to the finish. So I want to encourage you to, excuse me, go back and listen to that. But we all know that life comes, of course, with challenges. And Jesus said it. We read this in our uh, chat first week. Uh, he said, you know, in his life, there'll be trials, there'll be tribulations, tests will come your way. He said, but be of good cheer uh, because I have already overcome. So I want to remind you this morning that whatever you're going through, the blood of Jesus has already overcome on your behalf. Amen. Praise God. So we know that we are winning. Somebody say, I'm winning. winning. Amen. Praise God. We're winning. But what we want to continue to talk about today is in the midst of winning and en route to the victory that we remain cool under whatever pressure comes our way. That we stay filled with chill as we make our way to these pressure through these pressure filled moments. Amen. Now, we talked about by definition, the word cool really means to be marked by some steady or dispassionate, dispassionate calmness and some self-control. So to be marked by steady, dispassionate calmness and self-control. So we've talked about being steady. We talked about being, you know, being calm to some degree. But again, part of that definition of being cool also means to have some self-control. So I want to talk a little bit about this awesome fruit of the spirit that God has blessed us with. And that is control. Amen. God has blessed us with the fruit of the spirit. We see it, we see it listed in the King James Version and other places as temperance, but it also means self-control. Somebody shout self-control. Self-control. Amen. So there's this part of us that God has given us this ability where we can control ourselves. Amen. Somebody say, I can control my own actions. Yes, we have a large degree, a large part to play in how certain things play out in our lives. And yes, there's other factors, there's external variables and people and things that may, you know, cause some some situations or things we have to navigate by. But at the end of the day, we also have a large part that we can play in controlling some of the atmosphere or some of the moment as well. Now, there's times when we can't, but there's also times when we can as well. Amen. So James says this over. In chapter one, it says uh, chapter one, we're going to read verse two. This has been our text. It says, consider it pure joy. And uh, one translation says, count it all joy. But he says, consider it pure joy in the NIV. He says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So it produces this perseverance, but it produces this, you know, uh, this calmness. But there's also this part of self-control that we have to tap into if we're going to remain cool and calm under pressure. Amen. Now, I know you might be saying if you're tuning in and you're hearing this for the first time and you're saying, well, okay, this is a message about temperance. But I want you to be reminded of this one thing. You know, the word tells us and, you know, Mark chapter four, as he's talking about how the sower sows the word. One of the things he says is that the enemy comes for the word's sake. And my responsibility as the pastor is not to just teach us things that make us feel all good and, you know, take some laps around the room or we can just strike up the organ and dance and shout, throw a head back, you know, and all that good stuff. You know, it's not all about art. It's really about making sure from Genesis to Revelation, we teach the full counsel of the gospel. Because one of the things that, you know, you hear people say things, well, oh, that's the faith message. That's the gospel message. You know, the Bible is life's message. Amen. So as a result of that, we have to teach all those things relative to life and those things that actually happen in our lives so we can be victorious in this life we're living here as ambassadors for Christ. Amen. So get to give a full example for a second. So I want to say. So even this past week, you know, my family and I, we, we went through a moment where we had to lean on the word or even had was considered being probably thrust in a pressure field situation because the enemy once again comes for the word's sake. Um, so uh, many of you may know, of course, those who are in the room, uh, you know, many of our team members that, you know, this past week, you know, our oldest son, Ryan, you know, in, got injured in a uh, track meet. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty nasty fall, pretty nasty injury. Uh, he is doing supernaturally well. Amen. He's doing great. And, uh, I, you know, for you know, for those who've maybe never seen him run and things of that nature or just understand the nature of what he does. He's a sprinter, but uh, he's also a hurdler. 
as well. So he took a nasty tumble, something he's never done before, but he is doing fantastic. So I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to all those as well who've just been praying for him. We thank you for uh, your prayers and continued prayers as he's healing up and uh, getting himself back in form uh, to be able to do all the things that God's destined and ordained for him. But I said all that to say and brought that up to understand that, you know, we had no idea of what our week was going to be filled like, you know, after we left church last week on Sunday. But again, the enemy comes to make sure that do you really believe the word has been sown into your heart? So I'm saying that to remind you that, you know, we can hear certain subjects in church and then we may be saying at that moment, that's not for me. But God always knows what is for you. And the enemy comes once again to steal the word that's been sown into your heart. So we have to grab hold of the gospel anytime the gospel is being ministered and say, what is it, Lord, that you want me to get out of that? So when that pressure comes or when that instant comes to come against the, what the word has taught you, you are ready and prompted to fight against it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we talked about how he said, consider it all joy and We use that as our text scripture because we understand that in certain situations, again, not only is the enemy coming for the word, but it's going to pressure you to the point where it may rattle or take a testing at your uh, uh, at your peace, at your joy and those other things as well. We talked about early on how we understand, you know, we've heard the phrase many of us before how pressure produces diamonds and we understand that that's true. But one of the things we've talked about over these last two weeks, and I want to use this final day to kind of drive that home, is we have to make sure in the wake of the pressure, we respond the right way. And that's where this self-control comes into play. You know, now in uh, some urban vernaculars, we've heard the term, you know, go off, right? Amen. I don't want you going off on anybody. So I want you to tap into this temperance, this self-control that God has placed on the inside of you so you can live this nice, calm, peaceable life in all godliness. Amen. Praise God. So I want to I want to have you go over to Luke chapter nine really quick. Luke chapter nine. So I wanted to start with this particular uh, story here in the Bible. I thought it was very fitting because it reminds us that you and I are still works in progress. Amen. We don't ever want to get to the place where we feel like we've arrived because at the end of the day, we have to walk out the authority of the word just like anybody else. Praise God. So I'm always reminded of how when the angels of God, he tells us in the book of Revelations, how they were going around the throne of God. And it talks about how every time they would come about, they would see a new facet of God's glory. Well, we have to open our hearts to the word of God in that same fashion, that every time we open up this Bible, every time we sit before, you know, the throne of God or we're lying at the master's feet, we open our hearts up to revelation knowledge so God can show us something that perhaps we didn't see the last time we read those verses of scripture. Amen. So I want to have you go to Luke chapter nine. And what's happening right here is, you know, Jesus is about to have this encounter with the Samaritans. Now, of course, we know this is not his first encounter with the Samaritans, uh, but he's about to have this encounter with them. And the Bible talks about how he's on his way to Jerusalem, but he needs to stop. And he's going through uh, Samaria. Now, a little backdrop, and I've taught this before, but just a reminder for those who may not be aware. So the Samaritans were a mix of people, a group of people were, who were brought over by the Babylonian king. And they were now residing, you know, in Jerusalem in you know, certain little sects outside of Jerusalem, you know, and they were now individuals who had commingled, you know, and began to learn some of the customs of Jewish tradition. Some of them were picking up, you know, putting down some of their false gods and now picking up some of the, you know, the rudiments of the faith. But they still had these differences in opinions with respect to how Orthodox Jews believed. So they believed that the Messiah was supposed to do this and be born in this place and the kingdom be set up here. You know, the uh, true Jewish people, uh, you know, the ones who returned back from Babylon didn't quite disagree and you know, looked at them as outcasts and didn't really accept them as much. So they were in these constant rifts with one another. So I want to pick up right here in this particular story. And it says in verse 51, it says, now, when it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face 
to go to Jerusalem. Now, that is a problem for them right off the bat because, of course, they did not really want him or believe that the kingdom was supposed to be established in Jerusalem. They felt like it was supposed to be established in this other place. So the fact that he's just passing by, he's going through there, but he's not setting up camp there as the risen king. That's a problem for them. Amen. It says so he's and he sent his messengers before his face talking about his disciples. And it says, and as they went, it says here, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. It says, but they did not receive him. Why? Because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. So because they didn't like what he was doing, where he was going, they said, you know what? We don't want to have anything to do with this guy. Now, many of us have probably been in situations where somebody disagreed with your perspective, somebody disagreed with your outlook, they didn't understand your way of thinking, and as a result, what, what probably happened? They did not accept you. So I'm here to remind you today that it is okay. They didn't quite agree with Jesus' perspective and what God had told him to do at that moment, but yet it didn't stop him from doing what he was sent to do by the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. So let the church say amen. So it says, so they didn't receive him because he set his face for the journey to Jerusalem. Verse 54. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, listen to this. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? Now, when I read that, I just had to stop and smile. I don't know about you. Because one of the things that you see with these disciples is that they were really Jesus kind of ride or die. They were definitely with them. Amen. Now, they might have had their moment when, you know, at the end. But hey, for the most part, these disciples were really with Jesus. Now, I read that because talking about self-control, talking about managing your anger, talking about, you know, having some cool, under, you know, in the midst of the pressure. Right there in that moment, cool was out the door. They said, you know what, Lord, why don't we just send some fire down? I'll consume all of them. Come on now. That's not how we're supposed to respond. Amen. So we all can have this urge at certain points in times where we want to take our salvation and say, you know what, let me just put that on the shelf for a moment, because that's going to be the last time you talk about my mama. That'll be the last time that you do this to me on my job. That'll be the last time you disrespect me. Come on, somebody. You know, you had these moments where somebody has said something, did something, and you've decided within yourself in a moment's instant that I'm not saying, oh, let me just take my earrings off. You know, girl, you about to get it, man. Man, I'm about to hit you. So we all had these moments. In fact, there was this old song uh, that a gentleman sang, you know, out of Atlanta years ago. And some of you probably heard this song before. It was by Canton Jones. And the, the, the title of the song was I'm Going to Stay Saved. And he was really singing in the song how life's tests were coming or people were doing things, but he wasn't going to lose his salvation. He was going to remain righteous, remain dignified, remain sanctified, remain a person of God and not display a behavior or character that was unlike God. So let's listen to what Jesus says to them right after that. It says in verse 55, but he turned and he rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. He said, for the son of man did not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. What he was saying to them was really, fellas, get it together. Keep your composure. Keep your cool under, underneath the pressure. They may not want us here. They may not be treating us right. They may be doing you wrong, but you have to remain in the character that I placed on the inside of you. Your love walk, praise God, your patience, your long suffering, all of that has to now go to a heightened level when somebody has decided to do you wrong, treat you wrong, say something wrong, or act out of character. Now, I mentioned on last week, you know, that Peter, that uh, Jesus recognized when Peter had said something to him, he said, get thee behind me, Satan, to him. Because he understood that he wasn't dealing with flesh and blood, but he was dealing with the spirit behind the individual. So when we understand these things because we have revelation knowledge of God's word and we're bearing truth, it keeps us in a place where we're a little bit more able to remain calm and cool under the pressure and operate with some self-control. Somebody say self-control. He's saying, look, this is not how we handle things. 
We don't want to send fire down and consume them because they don't want us in their city because they don't agree with the way that I'm handling things. Praise God. We got to make sure that we remain cool in the midst of it. Now, I'm going to take you over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Really quick, very familiar verses of scripture for us, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, we know this is kind of considered the the love chapter, as it were. Uh, Many people refer to that. So I'm going to draw your attention to one of, the, one of the verses there. We'll pick up in verse 4. We're not going to read the whole, time, whole thing for time's sake. But it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Let's read it together, if you would, if you can see it on the screen, or you can read it aloud if you're right there at home. Let's read it together. Verse number 4, ready? Read. Love suffers long and is kind. Let's start over. I don't hear anybody here. Praise God. Let's read that one more time. Verse number 4. Oh, Josh, who's got the... Come here. Let's show. <laughs> All right. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. And love is not puffed up. Now, I want to back up to that very first part of that scripture. Love suffers long. Come on, somebody. It says love suffers long. Long. Now, there's a Greek word for that, which actually means, you know, macrothumia. Or you'll hear it and see it in other places. It says love is patient. So it's patient, but it's actually a part of that definition. It means long suffering. So to have some macrothumia, somebody say macrothumia. It means to be long spirited. It means to be forbearing and patient. It means to bear or to suffer Long, it means to be long-suffering or to have long patience, which means, think about it this way. Think of a candle that has a wick or, or, or some dynamite with a fuse. That's, that's a better, better, better example. So dynamite with a fuse. You don't want a short f- fuse where it's going to blow up just like that. Imagine if it's, you know, when I was a kid, we used to play with, you know, these things called jumping jacks and swirly things, and you light it, and you throw it, and it's zzz, all this type of stuff, firecrackers. But you don't want one with a, with a wick that's too short. You want one with a long wick, even if it's dynamite, to give you an opportunity to throw it or get to wherever you need to be so you can now be in a safe place. Amen? It's really kind of saying to us, with respect to your love, and how you interact with people, your long suffering has to have a long wick that gives them opportunity to fix it, but also gives you opportunities to get your emotions in check. At the end of the day, we're still emotional beings. We're spirit, soul, and body. Man lives in a body, possesses a soul, which is your mind, will, and your emotions. And oftentimes our emotions will get us into a place or into some uh, spaces where things aren't good for us. Emotions and individuals not being long suffering or their inability to operate with self-control has cost people their jobs. It has cost people friendships. It has cost people marriages, relationships, girlfriends, boyfriends, et cetera, et cetera, because they could not control themselves in the moment. God has given us the fruit of temperance. Because check this out, people. The moment you say something, you can't just reel it back. So the word I just said, back, I can't throw it back into my mouth like I've never said it. Your ears heard it, and whatever power or definitive message comes behind that word, you're now receptive to it because I just said it. And you can say, oh, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean that. But most people, we talked about this before, when pressure comes, and let's say there's squoes, what's deposited on the inside? The Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So we have a tendency to say not only what we're thinking, but more or less even what's in here the moment pressure comes. It's like taking the sponge and wringing it out. Whatever's in the sponge is going to come out of the sponge. So we want to be long-suffering. And we want to ask God to help us in our self-control and temperance because that will allow us to remain cool under pressure. You can't go into your boss's, uh, you know, uh, office asking for a raise or even explaining the situation. They don't quite agree with you. Then you just decide to flip the desk over and leave like you're John Brown. or something. You can't do that. 
Amen? This is not the movies. Because guess what? You do that in real life, they're calling the cops on you. <laughs> Praise God. So we have to be able to keep our emotions in the same, in a, in a, in a safe place. But we also want to be able to give people, I mentioned this, give other humans space to be human. See, when we make mistakes, we want people to see us in our frailty as humans. We want people to accept the fact that we made a mistake, that, you know, we didn't quite mean it that way. But we also have to reciprocate that. And our ability to be able to reciprocate that comes from our ability to stay in control of our emotions, to operate with some self-control, some self-restraint, and not just now respond in kind. You know, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. In fact, go over with me over. Nah, we won't go there yet. Uh, <clears throat> go over to Proverbs chapter 16 really quick. Proverbs chapter 16. Somebody say, I have self-control. Oh, Lord, we got to have it. We have to operate in it. Amen. <clears throat> I promise you, you'll find yourselves in situations, whether it's making the right decision, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, doing the right thing. We have to stay in control. You make better decisions when you're stable. We all do. When we're operating in a stable plane, we're not hurried. We're not uh, we're not pressured. Most of us will make far better decisions. But there will be times in life where we have to make decisions that calls for immediate answers or immediate responses. How do we handle those things? That's when we have to keep ourselves in control. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So it tells us over in Proverbs chapter 16. So I'm going to give us a few tools and we're going to keep rolling and we're going to be done here in just a moment. I hope this is blessing you. Praise God. It might step on a few toes, but guess what? God is the healer. Amen. So he tells us over in Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 32, he says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. So even in the Proverbs, he's saying to us, it's good to be slow to anger. It's good to be that person who doesn't, uh, let, let's see, bolster in the fact that you don't take any stuff. Girl, man, I go off on folks. No, that means you don't have any self-control. Oh, I'm going to say it again. I might have hurt somebody's feelings right there. See, we can't be patting ourselves on the back because we have a firm tongue. There's a space for being firm, but then sometimes we have to pause to make sure it is indeed well. Sometimes firmness isn't required. That's for somebody. We're going to leave that alone. Amen. Sometimes we got to just be able to get our emotions in check and say, before I respond to that, I'm just going to think about this a little bit. Think about it over in John chapter eight. Now, I don't have you turn over there. But <clears throat> once again, when, you know, there was a the Samaritan lady who uh, they decided that they were going to stone and they now start asking Jesus, well, what do you think? You know, she's been you know, she's with this particular person and it's not her husband, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, it talk, and Jesus says to them, well, he he was he who was without sin cast the first stone. So he looks up. And all of these, all of the woman's accusers are beginning to walk away. But the whole time while they're asking him, what do you think we should do? This, this should happen. That should happen, et cetera, et cetera. When you go back and read that, it talks about how Jesus was just calmly writing in the sand, calmly taking his time. He didn't lash back out. And then he said to them what many would believe to be profound. Hey, well, whoever's, you know, never sinned in your life, you go ahead and throw the first stone. But I always take notice of the part how it says how Jesus didn't respond right away. He was calmly writing in the sand because I, you know what happens there? I believe Jesus was now allowing his spirit man to say what needed to be said rather than him responding out of the soulish realm and allowing his emotions to just kick in and say what needs to be said. Think of how many times you may have said something to your son or to your daughter or to your spouse or to, you know, to a, to a peer or coworker. And you said it in the heightened sense of emotions. And then you just wished I could take that back. All we have to do is progressively work on how we keep ourselves under control. He says, because he who rules his spirit is like the one who's able to take the city mighty in power. Amen. Now, Matthew chapter five says this. Now, you can turn. I, think, I believe you may be over there already. Somebody say, I am in control. Praise God. Yeah, we got to declare it and speak it, even if that's not the case right now. So remember, I said we're all a work in progress. Now, I read that story about 
you know, the disciples, you know, James and John and how they responded when the people told them they couldn't stay in the city because I thought it was a really good example of how sometimes we can let our emotions take us somewhere that we never intended to go. And Jesus just brought them back in and said, hey, hey, fellas, that's that's not how we're supposed to respond. We want to make sure that we stay in the character that God has blessed us with and operate from that godly character, because that's what leads people to the kingdom of God. Amen. So he says this in Matthew, chapter five, verse thirty eight. He says, and you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a two for two. He says, but I tell you this, Jesus is talking, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you or anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, I know a lot of people when they read this, you're thinking, hey, somebody hit me, punched me in the face, slapped me. Uh, that's, that's it. That'd be the last slap, last punch they ever make. Amen. Now, I'm going to be honest. That's my mindset, too. If you, if, you, if you slap me, punch me in the face, you probably are going to realize it was a natural response to smack you back. I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Let's somebody say pray for Pastor Brooks. Pray for Pastor Brooks. Amen. I'm a work in progress. Praise God. I'm self-control, self-control. Matter of fact, if you see me at my desk or something somewhere and I'm just rubbing my ears. Oh, ooh, saba. No, just kidding. So, hey, but we want to make sure that we're keeping ourselves in control. He says, if someone slaps you, turn to them the right cheek and then the other cheek also. He says, if somebody wants to sue you or take your shirt, he says, hand over or hand that over uh, and your coat as well. And if anybody forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. He says, give to the one who asks you and do not uh, turn away from the one who does not or wants to borrow for you. Once again, Jesus is teaching them macrothumia, how to be long suffering. Somebody say it with me. Long suffering. Because if I'm going to operate with self-control, I have to be able to suffer long. Now, I said it suffer long that way because we think of long suffering. Well, what does it mean to be able to suffer more than just 30 seconds? Let the church say amen. To not respond in the, with the wrong response because things aren't going our way. Things does not look our way. Praise God. We have a way that we can handle this. Now he goes on and he's saying to them, turn the other cheek. You know, what is he saying right there? You don't have to contest everything. And I think sometimes we, you know, we grow up and we're taught certain things. And, you know, just as I just said, you know, our natural response, if someone says this, you do this. If somebody does that, you do that. Well, I've lived long enough to understand that even some of the great things that I was taught, it's like book sense versus practical knowledge. I had to learn from a practical standpoint that some of those things needed a little brushing up. Amen. They needed to be smoothed around the edges a little bit. What, I'm, what are you saying by that, Pastor Brooks? Some of those things are for certain moments, but it's not for every situation. And we can take it and paint things with a broad brush and say, well, my parents told me or taught me if somebody does this, then you do that. That may be true, but listen to what the word of God is saying. He's saying right here that we have to have some self-control. Sometimes we're not supposed to contest certain things. Sometimes we're supposed to stand our ground or we're supposed to now use our words. There's a better way to resolve conflict oftentimes than the route that we take. But it, uh, it does not happen if we get out of control. Amen. Let's keep reading here. Now, we're going to go over to verse number 43. And he says something here that's familiar for everybody. He says, and you've also heard it said this, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But then so Jesus is saying, this is what your parents might have told you. But now this is what I'm teaching you. So he's making the same analogy again. He says, love your neighbor. You might have heard it been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but I'm telling you this. Love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Another translation says, pray for those that despitefully use you. So he's saying, yeah, I know what you've been taught, but let me reshape. Let me reframe your thinking so that you can stay in this place of being long suffering, operating with some macrothumia and some temperance. Praise God. I want you to love your enemies and I want you to pray for those who have done you wrong. Now, everybody sitting in this room right now can probably think of someone and everyone watching me online that has done you wrong in some way, shape, form or fashion. The question becomes, 
that moment is probably over. It doesn't matter how you handled it then, but now let's learn the lesson from what could I have possibly done different? Because sometimes some of us will say something or do something that severs that relationship. Remember I said it earlier, some of us have lost friends, lost jobs, lost marriages, lost relationships because we didn't respond the right way in the moment because we lack self-control. Here's our opportunity to say, Lord, once again, I'm going to take your way and your method of doing things, and I'm going to forget about what they said, and I'm going to look at what you're saying. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you or persecute you. He says that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends his reign upon the righteous and the unrighteous. I love how the King, King James says it, upon who you deem the just or the, and the unjust. He says, what is he saying? I love them the same way I love you. Now, this is good for the body of Christ because, you know, we can sometimes operate from this perspective. It's us and them. We are all children of God. Amen. You may not believe in certain uh, aspects, uh, you know, from a religious perspective. But again, I've taught you from the moment we opened this church, we're not teaching religion. We're teaching relationship with the living God. See, and people get caught up on religious things about, you know, whether you speak in tongues, whether you were baptized in the name of the Father, were you baptized in the Son, were you baptized in the Holy Ghost, were you baptized in the name of Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. We get caught up on these things, and because of these things, we deem ourselves, well, I'm a little bit better than you because I'm from the sect of uh, Judea, or I'm from the sect of Bremelton, well, I'm from the sect of uh, Leesburg or Lansdowne. What does that matter? We're all children of God is what he's saying right here. He goes on to say, and if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? He says, are not even the tax collectors doing that? He says, and if you only, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? He's like, so what are you doing that's different if you're not operating a little different? He says, do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect, Jesus is saying, love your neighbor, pray for those that harm you. What is he also saying? Be quick to forgive. Now, I'm going to throw that out there again because I don't have time to go deep into that because that can be a whole message all in and of itself. But he's saying, be slow to anger because if you're slow to anger, you'll also be quick to forgive. You'll also operate with some self-control. You'll be long-suffering with other individuals. What is he saying? Love, 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 love. Now I'll say this for those who may not have ever heard it before. I was taught this a long while ago and it has always stuck with me in terms of how we should view agape, the God kind of love. And the God kind of love is determined by the character of the one who loves, not by the one who is being loved. See, because what he's saying is you have to love at all costs, but you can't determine how somebody accepts it. Just stay in character and in the shape and form and fashion in which God has created you and allow, allow the fruit of the spirit to live big in you. It doesn't matter how they respond. So that's why he was able to say to them, you know what, if they smack you on this seat, turn the other one also. Because he was really trying to say at some point, your love will destroy whatever hate, whatever issue, whatever problem, whatever circumstance there is. The Bible tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. Love will, will obliterate whatever mess or thing that's out of whack. That's why we say love your people through it. That's why we say come to Jesus just as you are and just let God love you through it. That's why we say you don't have to stop smoking. You don't have to stop drinking. You don't have to stop cursing. You don't have to stop living a certain life to think, well, let me get it all cleaned up before I come to Jesus. No, because love, the God kind of love, the way he loves us is based on his character. It's not about how you do it or what you do. And that's how we have to love other people when we keep ourselves in control by doing that. Secondly, I'm going to say this. Uh, I'll say be inclined to, to, to talk and to listen, or we can just say talk and listen. Because I think sometimes we don't do enough listening and we don't do enough talking. 
Let the church say amen. (laughs) And as a result of it, it breeds conflict, unnecessary conflict. And it also breeds unnecessary offense because we don't talk or sometimes we don't listen. So I'm going to give you two two little quick, quick verses of scripture. I think it'll help us really quick. Matthew 18, 15 and 17. And Jesus is talking about how do you handle certain situations. And one of the things he says, moreover, if your brother sins against you or your brother misses the mark, does something to you, listen to what it says. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. What is he saying? Don't go tell your girlfriend. Don't go tell your boy. Don't go tell the teacher. Don't go tell everybody else. Try to resolve it. Talk to the person. And as you're talking to them, listen to what's being said. So many things turn into big things because we didn't take the time to talk it out. Woo! Hallelujah. He says, and if he hears you, you have gained a brother. He goes on to say in verse 16, and if you will not hear, take one or two more people with you. Then that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he then refuses or she refuses, then tell it to the church. Go maybe get your your pastor or some others in in, in place to 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 help to uh, mediate. He says, but if he refuses even to hear the church, then you can view that person as a heathen and a publican because he's not going to listen to God. He's not going to listen to anybody. Come on now. That's straight from the Bible. So he's saying, try to work it out with the person before you share it with the masses. But listening and talking things out will eliminate misunderstandings. So much offense and loss of control happens because of misunderstandings or mishearing. So I'll say this. I had to learn this lesson very early on in life, and I'm still working because I'm a work in progress. Somebody say, I am a work in progress. Yes, we haven't arrived yet. Amen. And one of the things I had to learn is stop waiting for your opportunity to respond and just listen. Because if you're thinking about your response, you're not listening. You're not actively listening. Come on. So we got to learn how to actively listen. And when we do that, oftentimes it eliminate misunderstandings. Because sometimes a misunderstanding or our, our loss of control comes because I thought he said or I thought she said this. Or, oh, here's a whole nother one, which really makes no sense. It looked like. What do you mean it looked like? So it looked like I was going to form my lips to say something the wrong way, so you just decided, well, let me just cut him first. (laughs) Amen? We got to talk. We got to listen. Proverbs 18, 19 says this, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. So we got to make sure that we're long-suffering so that we, we don't become the offended And we don't become the offender. Come on now. So let your words be seasoned with grace. Because, you know, as that old saying goes, you catch a lot more bees with honey. (laughs) Amen. Let your words be seasoned with grace. Speak to people the way that you want to be spoken to, praise God. And let the love of God resonate there. Lastly, I'll say this. Resist revenge. So many people get to the place where they're like, hey, retaliation is all they're thinking about. And that's not how God created us. If you read throughout the verse of scripture, oftentimes you'll see things. And I love it many times with David. And I think we read this a few weeks ago. First Samuel chapter 30, you know, when the Amalekites and everyone had taken his wives, taken his, his sons and daughters and ran off and burned down the whole city there. You know, he didn't just immediately jump up and go. What did he do? He consulted God first. And he said, Lord, should I pursue them? Now, you got to imagine the, the anger, the frustration, the, the hurt, the, the grief and everything that's taking place right there in that moment. These people have lost their families, lost their wives, lost their sons and daughters. All their, their homes have been burnt to the ground. But rather than lose control in that moment, now he was the greatest warrior of that time. So in an instant, if he was thinking this is what we're doing, him, he and his mighty men of valor were going to take out everybody. That wasn't a question of could he do it? But he said, let me talk to God first. And he said, Lord, should I pursue? See, and in that moment, I believe the spirit of God, you know, spoke to him and, you know, in that connection with the father and that relationship. And it allowed him to make the right decision because he didn't just respond out of the hurt out of the emotions, out of the guilt, or out of the shame, or whatever else was going on at that time. So we got to resist revenge. Romans 12 tells us this. 
Verse number 17, repay no man evil for evil. Bears repeating. Repay no man evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. One translation says, live at peace with all men. If it's at all possible, as much as it depends on, on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Never allow revenge to be your motivation. Guess what? Because it's a temporary satisfaction. It won't change what happened. And it's a temporary satisfaction. That's why God is saying this is not how we want to handle things. He says, do not avenge yourselves, but rather, place to, but, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, God said this, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. He says, for in, do, in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his, set, on his head. That's not meaning you're putting coals on his head, you're going to burn them up. If you look at them in their time, in that part of history, oftentimes they wore some wrappings on their head and they would put the coals upon them to actually warm their whole body. So he's saying, give them something to physically warm them totally. And he goes on to say, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. But I can't do that if I lose control. <laughs> because when you lose control, it's like, Lord, I, I know I'm saved, but I'm, you know, praise God. And that's not where we want to be. We got to realize that every battle is not your battle to fight. I'll say that again. Every battle is not your battle to fight. So you can read this at your own time, but you go over to Second Chronicles and you read, you know, about Jehoshaphat and, you know, uh, the children of Ammon coming, coming against him. And what happens? In verse number 20, God tells him, this battle is not yours. He says, you don't even need to fight. And he tells him, I want you to just stand still and see the salvation of God. See the healing power of God now break forth and it'll do something that you can't do. See the preserving power of God break forth because it'll do something that you absolutely can't do. See the deliverance come forth from God because it'll do something that you absolutely can't do. You're broken right now with a bruised or contrite heart. See the deliverance power. See the, the healing power of God break forth right now and let it do something that we absolutely can't do. The battle is not always yours to fight. Sometimes we just got to give it over to God. And lastly, and, and I'll say this, sometimes you just got to pause and laugh at certain situations. I don't know if you've ever been there, but somebody says something and, do, and does something and maybe try laughing before you just go off. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes it, it may sound or be so absurd to you. All you can do is laugh. You're going to do what? <laughs> Who you tripping? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got to laugh at the devil sometimes. So in, in the wake of, you know, this whole week and, you know, what was going on with our son, you know, we had to sit back and say, you know what? Whew. Lord, we just laugh at this situation because we know you got it. Yeah. We know this will be for the manifestation of your power and your glory and your power showing in him and through him and everything else. This, uh, this will be the, the manifestation or the, the hallmark that says there's a greater glory that's to come. So sometimes, we're, we're, not sometimes, anytime something's happening in your life, you got to know that I'm still more than a conqueror. I'm still called to be victorious. God is still your banner, praise God. He's still El Elyon. He's the most high. He has all things in control. He's still leading you. He's still guiding you. He's still protecting you, praise God. He's still delivering you. He didn't just stop being your place of refuge, your place of peace. We got to just know that God's got it. Praise God. So we don't lose control in the midst of it all. Sometimes we can do that by just laughing that thing off. Now, the Bible tells us over, go to Proverbs 17 real quick, and we're going to close here. But Psalm 2.4 says this, that, you know, he who sits in heaven laughs. I believe God has a sense of humor. Right, let me give you an example. I believe when Lucifer came to God and he told him, I'm going to take over heaven. And I'm going to run all this and I'm going to be mightier than you. How does it describe in the Gospels? And it says, and Jesus says, and I saw, G I saw Satan <laughs> fall from heaven like, <laughs> like thunder, like lightning. See, he understood, I think in that particular moment, I'm just visualizing that when Satan came to him and said, this is what I'm going to do 
to you, Jesus just started laughing in the midst of it all. Whatever the enemy is saying he's going to do to you in your life, oh, you, you just got to laugh that thing off. You'll never get that promotion. <laughs> Devil, you, you are a lie, and the truth is not in you. You'll never finish school. Uh, devil, you are a lie and the truth is not in you. Your son or your daughter will, will never amount to anything. You are a truth. You are a lie and the truth is not in you. You got to laugh that thing off. Why? Because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 17, too, is that a merry heart does good like a medicine. Being able to keep that peace in your heart, that joy in your heart, that fulfillment and laughter in your heart, praise God, it'll help keep you cool. Remember, we talked about it's being able to have that physical restraint, that that ability to uh, have that self-control, that calmness come upon you that nothing else brings. Whatever you got to do to get yourself there. You know, I, I'm going to give you I'm going to close with this. I'm going to tell you this one one thing that it always just makes me laugh. And I kind of think about this uh, anytime I think about what the devil's trying to do. I believe the movie, I, I can't think of the name of it really quick, but it was Harlem Nights. Maybe that's it. So there's a scene in the movie. Now, if you've seen this, you, you'll get me on this. Praise God. Harlem Nights. I don't know anybody ever seen it. A couple of hands. Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor, that's the whole gang. Okay. So there's a scene in the movie where they're shooting these machine guns, right? And it's like these Tommy guns, and they're shooting these Tommy guns at, at the perceived enemy. And then... There's this other guy who's standing next to the three guys who are shooting Tommy guns. And it's like. And then he stands there. And he has like a six shooter. and He goes. Pow. <laughs> and then they start shooting again. And then he stands there and he goes. Pow. <laughs> so Arsenio Hall's character finally turns to him and he goes, man, if you shoot that little bitty gun one more time. Now, for me. When I think about the weaponry and the armor of God that God has given us, the sword of the spirit, the power that he gives us, I see myself. I see us as the individuals with the Tommy guns taking things out. But I see the devil with that little bitty old gun going. Pow. <laughs> so I just begin to laugh because I'm thinking if that's all you have with respect to a fiery dart, you better get it together because I'm going to light you up with the word of truth, praise God, and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do about it because because of the word and the blood, I shall and will overcome every situation. So every time I see it, pow, it just makes me chuckle because I'm like, is that all you have? Is that all that the enemy has for you? Praise God. You better fire the weapons that God has given you. You better light him up. You better serve him. Notice that you are victorious because you have something that he does not have. You got the power of heaven back in you. Praise God. <laughs> so you can shoot that little cap gun all you want. But I'm dropping something big on you that you won't be able to have a handle devil. Amen. Praise God. Let's go ahead and just lift our hands and thank God for his goodness. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the fruit of temperance. We thank you, Father God, that you've blessed us with long suffering as one of those fruit as well. Thank you for our ability to forbear, to be able to handle the toughest of situations. Thank you, Father, for always pulling us up, always leading us through. Thank you, Father, that we're strengthened by the power of your might. That the most high, high God, El Elyon, is our backing. It's our support and our strength. <laughs> yes. You can fire those little fiery darts all you want. But we declare our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have on the <laughs> shield of faith. We have on a breastplate of right. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Praise God. There's nothing we can't handle. Nothing we can't do. Devil, we will not be denied. And we'll remain cool under the pressure. Under the, under the circumstance. Under the test. And declare before heaven, we will indeed pass it. We thank you for it. We thank you now. 
Hallelujah. Yes, we thank you in Jesus' name. Now, you may have heard me say it earlier. I want to challenge you today. You don't have to wait to get yourself all cleaned up to come home to God, to be in relationship with him. So if that's you, you're not in a relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You don't know Jesus as Lord. You don't know him as your Savior. I want to pray with him for you today and give you this opportunity. Because just the way you are, just the way I was, just the way I am today, God loves you right there where you stand, right where you are, the way you are. All of your quirkiness, all of your idiosyncrasies, all of your, God loves you just the way you are. So I want to pray with and pray for you. And also I want to pray for those who might have gotten away from God, you gotten out of fellowship with him with respect to your relationship, haven't been spending time, you're just walking in the other direction, other direction. God wants you to come back home and I want to pray with and for you on today. So if that's you, I want you to get in on this prayer right now because we know God has so much greater for you. So let them know in the chat. I don't, I'm not able to see the name. So in case you're wondering, that's why I don't respond back. I don't see the names. I don't have it scrolling in front of my face or anything like that. But just let them know that you're getting in on this prayer. Just lift your hand. Put your little praise hands there. Thumbs up, whatever it takes. Let them know that you're getting in on this prayer. We love you. We're all standing in agreement with you. Now, I want to have everyone repeat this prayer after me. And right then, we'll be born again. We'll be saved. We'll be forgiven, set free, because God is indeed a restorative God. Come on, say it with me. Dear Heavenly Father, come into my life and save me now. I believe with my heart and I say out of my mouth that I'm saved. I thank you that my life is yours. My life is restored and it's been redeemed today. I thank you that I'm forgiven and I come home to you and I serve the enemy notice that I am victorious Through your name, because right now you're living in me and I in you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's just go ahead and put our hands together for those who may pray that prayer for the very first time. Amen. I want everybody to just say it with me. I am cool under pressure. Make that the declaration that you won't falter, you won't slip, you won't have any missteps, you won't do anything out of character, but you're going to remain cool and calm in the midst of whatever the enemy throws your way. Praise God. Now, before we sign off, we want to give those opportunities to sow, those who would like to sow into the kingdom of God an opportunity to do so. You'll see that information on the screen if that's what the Lord is placing, excuse me, upon your heart. And it'll be a text to give number there. It's 73256. Just text the word impact or ICN or IC Nova rather uh, right there. And it'll give you a, a message back and allow you to follow the prompts there. Be an absolute blessing for you. Also want to encourage you if you're in the area or you know somewhere here in the Ashburn, Virginia area. Um, next week we'll do a family and friends day. Uh, just want to be, have an opportunity to welcome some individuals back. I know a lot of people have been uh, vaccinating and uh, now that things have kind of opened up a little bit here and looking to come back uh, to church. Uh, so we'll love to have you here. We have plenty of room, plenty of space. Uh, at this particular time, we're still uh, may not have, will not have uh, specific, specifically children's ministry, but uh, the, all the young people are welcome. Doesn't bother me one bit. I used to be a youth pastor and I've sent through Hundreds of kids talking all at one time, just receiving and having feedback together so uh, we can make sure that we get the word of God uh, into our hearts on next week. It's also Father's Day. Dad's great opportunity for you to come back. Moms get dads to the house of God uh, or someone who is a father. I uh, believe we'll have a due season word for them as well as God just blesses our hearts. Praise God. So let's just bless your seed right now. Pray over it. Heavenly Father, we just pray for those who are sowing into the kingdom of God. Uh, We trust you, Father God, that their needs are met with an abundance of side. Uh, We thank you, Father God, for even Malachi chapter 3. And we thank you, Lord God, that even now you're uh, blessing them, Father, and pouring out blessing that they won't even have room enough to receive it all. So we trust you for that. Uh, We just declare, Father, that uh, the needs of their household are met with an abundance of side. We pray as a result of this seed and our gift giving on today. 
more men, women, and children will come to know you, uh, will enrich their lives as they come into the knowledge of the truth. And we thank you, Father God, for their deliverance, for their salvation even right now. Ministering spirits, go forth, bless the seed, bless the homes of the individuals represented here today, those who are watching and sowing online, uh, bless their households as well. Whatever their need is, we pray that the seed meets it on today. We call things well, and we call them blessed in the name of the Father, Son, and by the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, we thank you for joining us on today. Uh, once again, I just want to say thank you to all those who have uh, been praying for Ryan and uh, just continue to pray for him as he's supernaturally mending and healing. And uh, we thank God for uh, the community here and uh, just embracing us and all of your love and expressions of love. I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for that as well as teammates and coaches and uh, just a number of individuals in the, in the community. We just thank you for that. Um, just declare that once again, as we, as we go forth, uh, you can go ahead and lift one hand towards heaven, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you. Declare the blood of Jesus protects you and your family from danger seen and unseen. And just as he said, praise God in numbers, may his glory and continence uh, go before you and may the blessing rest mightily upon you and your household in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. And just remember to make a tremendous impact this week.